I'm happy to be here and to see so many young faces. I am asked in 45 minutes to present my theory. Dr. Ingers presented it in shorter time. I nevertheless believe that I am in the position of that Gentile who came to Rabbi Hillel, a early rabbinic authority, and asked him to teach the wisdom of Judaism in the time that the man, this worship of pagan religion, was able to stand on one leg. And uh, when he came first to Rabbi Shammai, he was a stern, severe man, he drove him out of the premises. But Rabbi Hillel, who was a kind spirit, he told him in one sentence, what it is all about, love thy neighbor as yourself. And the story tells us that the Gentile was converted. I do not trust to convert you, but I hope to leave here some seeds, some ferment of thought, of scepticism, of new look at the universe and what is in it. In this short period of time that I have before me, there will be a question and answer period later. I will have to tackle so many fields of science, as many as my work ramify to. My beginning was with the Old Testament. Here where I started. Maybe the years that I spent on psychoanalysis were not lost. I was surprised to see things so obvious. As sometimes in my room, my office room, when I heard story of a patient and so obvious was this, the situation and the man was blind to it. And here is the Old Testament, and here is the story of some events related to the time of the Exodus, and it is in the book of the Exodus and of Numbers, and you find it in the prophets and in Psalms, actually the entire Bible, Old Testament, turns around this crucial point in the history of that nation. But the event that the story describes, whether it is in Psalms, whether it is in the, book, in the story of the plagues, it is not usual events. And these were not miracles seen just by a couple of people. These were events that have been seen by the entire nation. More than this, the population of Egypt was in, involved. And if we think a little more, it, these events could not have been even limited to the land of Egypt. How, for example, the story of described in the book of Joshua with the sun and moon disrupted in the emotion. This could not be a vision just above the valley of Ajalon. It must have been seen all around the world. Wherever the day was still, and there where there was night, the night must have been more prolonged. And this was what we find. 
we make a travel, imaginary travel, from book to book, which means from land to land. And we read that the Mexicans and the Babylonians and the Persians and the Chinese, in all places of the world, the, the very events were observed, experienced, and they were certain at the event of, well, indifferent nature. I wondered, Joshua, in the book of Joshua, quoting from the book of Joshua, described this event in the sky and stones were falling down just two verses before the sky, stones from the sky. Joshua could not know, could he? The connection between the rotation of the earth and entering the earth into a cloud of meteorites? Could the Indians on this continent know the connection between the sun appearing over the horizon, eastern horizon, dropping down, again appearing, dropping down, and all the continent, this continent, bursting in flames? How could they know the connection so they could not invent the stories? Something must have happened. The same in China. And the same time, the tide, the earth is up in the rotation. So something must have happened to move parts of it, to atmosphere and to water. So we hear or we read about that rose in gigantic tides, gigantic tides that move, and the ocean was torn apart. Thomas says that not the, just the sea of passage, all the seas of the world were torn apart. Thus, as you see, we read with different eyes, with different minds the Old Testament, because otherwise it's really not understandable. What were these prophets talking about? What is the story about, about mountains that skip like rams or lambs and hills? And uh, do you understand what does it mean that nothing was on the outside, was a day like today, and the prophets talk to you about, about mountain melting like wax, sea erupting, if nothing of the kind happens. All the time spoken about earth trembling and some apparitions in the sky and coals falling down and some dust falling down stones, dust that make the entire river and sea turning red. Well, if this thing happened, if it happened, there must be not only in biblical source, but also in Egyptian source in the first place. A detailed record. I looked for it. I found it. Eyewitness describes the catastrophe, the very same place. Strange was to me that the translator of the papyrus, now in Holland, in the museum of the University of Leiden, and there since more than a hundred years, papyrus translated in 1909 by Gardner. He did not even feel that the very same verses that he translated in modern English, he could read in the story of the plagues in King James Version. This was also a case of some scotoma. But scotoma was with all of us. How is it that a book that was read more than any other book through many centuries, translated in scores of languages, 
commented upon by many commentators through the many through many generations that none of them was seeing or reading stone for stone and fire for fire even fundamentalists didn't imagine that mountain turning over means my mountains turning over but mountain turned over and moved from their places, moved from their roots. Here in America, we know that the Rocky Mountains moved many scores of miles. We know that the Alps moved from the north Italy to the where is today is Switzerland. That Matterhorn was overturned because the younger formations, fossils, are at the bottom, and the older are at the top. We will have to limit discussion of each discipline just by a few minutes, and we are already in the field of geology. It was always thought that the mountains were created, or so to say, built in the tertiary, which is back 60 million years, and the closest to us, one million years ago. But researchers, investigators who went to the Andes and to the Alps and to the Himalayas, all returned with the same verdict unbelievably young. Mountains were dragged up Himalayas. In time of Neolithic man, even in the time of Bronze man, the lakes, they are tilted, they are ancient shores. And in those lakes you find the vestiges of man, practically historical man. The same in, in the Andes, a city they are built where nothing grows because it is over 12,000 feet high. No cereal grows, no, no big city could have existed there, but the terraces agricultural terrace go up higher and higher into the permanent snow cover and don't know how far above 15,000 feet. So this entire anti plano at the shores of Titicaca, the largest lake in South America, was moved suddenly up by thousands of feet and Darwin himself when he visited Chile observed and decayed shells over thousand feet high at Valparaiso and he wondered he wondered also seeing so many bones of animals many of them that do not exist many of them of giant form, and he exclaimed in his diary, but the entire globe must have been, the entire frame of the globe must have been shaken in order to destroy so many animals from Terra del Fuego to the Bering Strait. And this phenomenon of annihilation of large masses of animals, sometimes to the very last of his species, is observable in on all five continents. In Alaska, where gold digging machines slice the cold muck 
myriads of animals are entombed in that muck torn limb from limb. North of Siberia, islands are built practically from of splinter trees and of bones of animals, not only of mammoths, none of which exist in our days, but also of horses, of buffaloes, of rhinoceroses, myriads of them. How would they come to the north? How would Hippopotami invade England? Or maybe from more ancient time, how would it be that corals that do not grow even in Mediterranean were growing in Spitsbergen or on the island of Greenland or along the northern rim of North America? How is it that in those animal hecatombs you find together animals that could not live together, ostriches and crocodiles and polar bear and seal and arctic fox. And the problem in geology is not only problem of annihilation of species, but also problem of origin of species, practically question of evolution. How could so many species that populate the earth and many more have populated without leaving a single descent? How could so many species evolve just by the mere process of competition from the original simple form, Faxi Unicera form. Just by competition, can you understand how a crocodile and a bird and a worm and a man and an insect with many legs all could come to be. And the very question of fossilization, a problem that was never adequately answered. With Darwin, it is animals are wading in shallow water, dying one wading, being covered by sun before predatory fish would devour their cadavers and the same time and the same breath diving claims that this process is going on only when the earth subsides and the process is very slow counted in thousands and tens of thousands of years so where is the chance for a cadaver to survive in this condition and have you seen a cut wading in shallow water. So something different, a different process was at action. The sea erupted. Often the sea and land change places. The immutability of contours of continents and seas, a dogma in geology has no basis in facts. And immediately we are the problem of the climate. The very ancient climates that were very different from what are they today. If those corals grew where they were found, Certainly the earth was not traveling with the same elements of rotation and revolution, which means not on the same orbit, not with the axis directed in the same position as it is today. 
If you don't believe it, try to cultivate corals and North Pole. It is a problem of change of climate and close to our time we know that 1500 BC and again in the 8th century BC climate drastically changed. This was established long before I turned my interest to those problems, especially by Scandinavian authors. Exactly in those two periods of time about which my first book, World in Collision, speaks in two parts of it. The catastrophes of the day of the Exodus, followed by 50 years by the catastrophe in the day of Joshua, and again another series of catastrophes that happened in the in the 8th and the beginning of the 7th century, in the time of the great prophet Isaiah and Amos and Hoshea and Joel. And these are a few only questions about geology and climate. And just this week you have the information that oceanographers who went to mm, uh, mm, to Mediterranean came with the conclusion that volcanoes there is an island, volcanic island, Terra or Santarin, north of Creta, erupted with a terrific force. This was known already since quite a while, in 1500 BC. But they came with a new conclusion, and you can read it in this present issue of Time magazine. Fifty years later, another similar catastrophe and eruption. But this is what I spoke about in the first part of Odin Collision about these two catastrophes. The catastrophe of Joshua that took place 52 years after the catastrophe of the Exodus. And the same period of time we have also the same interval in Mesoamerican sources. Mayas and Aztecs, Toltecs before them. So the question of volcanism in the past, why was it so much? Of earthquake, we have even in the days of Punic War, in one year, something like 50 dispatches arriving in Rome concerning earthquakes. Which means that earthquakes is a residue of those events that took place when the earth was twisted out of its position. And that it was twisted out of its position we learn from many fields. One is ocean itself. On the bottom of the ocean there runs a ridge twice around the globe. With a deep chasm along it, discovered only eight or seven years ago, strangely enough so late. And on the bottom of the ocean we find ash in a level so of the same thickness under the bottom of the Pacific and according to more assuming other, also other oceans that he had only to make the conclusion that this so-called Wurzel Ash was of extraterrestrial origin. And in the clay of the bottom is nickel that could be only coming from immense showers of meteorites. And if we leave the problem of paleontology and geology and ancient climate and we only had a chance so shortly mentioned some problems of 
theory of evolution and of ocean studies and of paleomagnetism to which I will add one sentence. In ancient rocks and lava we see magnetic field reversed and thousand times more intense than Earth could invest in them. Reversed suddenly. And we have in archaeology archives of cuneiform tablets with astronomical observation, very dry observation mathematically exposed. The exposition is very simple. And you read and you find in these tens of thousands of tablets found in Nineveh in the palace of Ashurbanipal that was destroyed in 612 B.C. And these tablets were stored them from time earlier, observation of period before 7th century. All those tablets that are before 7th century are, are according to the Babylonian scholars entirely wrong. But how could they be wrong? Why should they be wrong if the writing of the studies was not an easy process? Observe, to observe, to impress in, in clay, to store just wrong figures for no reason at all. And there are tens of thousands of tablets like this in the British Museum alone. There are also manual of astronomy that describes the, the way of measuring, the way of observation, and there you find that the length of the day and the, and the shortest day and the longest day of the year and the direction of the axis, the polar star, the length of the moon, the movement of the planets, everything was different before 700 BC. This is really a field to study and not to neglect or reject, saying that this could not be true and therefore it is, these are imaginary figures, it is not legend that you make it you are free to follow your imagination. And those Babylonians were very well versed in mathematics, admitted. And in archaeology we find so many other evidence, whether it is in historical texts, whether it is in foundation of the tombs, on the key foundation of the temples, whether it is in tombs, we find again and again proofs of those catastrophes and changes in the position of the globe. Now we are approaching the field of astronomy. If the changes took place, apparently not the Earth alone, but many other members of the solar system were involved. In mythology we read about Theomachy, Battle of the Gods. And we wonder, we wonder about this ancient text, why I ask again and again why the ancient worship planetary gods. Jupiter and Mars and Saturn or Zeus and Athen and Kronos and others, Mercury, Hermes, all were more important to them. Were greater deities of the sun, life-bearing sun light-bringing sun. There must be reason for it. There must be reason why temples were built. Do you know the explanation why Zeus was always 
in the speech of the ancient, why temples were built to it? Are you so impressed also by the planet Jupiter that you would regard it as a chief deity above sun and moon? And they worship those planets, those gods in the planets themselves. They were lifting their hands, the Babylonians and the Indians, Hindu and the Chinese, all of them were lifting their hands to those planets and worshipping them. And human sacrifice were brought to them. And even to re into recent times, among the in American Indians, in the last century still, human, war human sacrifice were brought to the planet Venus. And we are really before questioning the fundamentals of astronomy too, cosmology and astronomy. Because it was accepted that the solar system has no history at all. So it was created, if not 6,000 years ago, then 6 billion years ago. But then for six billion years there was no change. Whether it was created or came into being by tidal action of a passing star, which would be catastrophic, as the tidal theory wishes, or in growing out of a nebula, nebula theory that goes back to Kant and Laplace. But since creation there was no change. But if what I am telling you is true, then there were changes and many and very recently too. Therefore I claim that moon must be still hot under its surface. That lunar, lunar craters that anyway were explained in a catastrophic way, whether by large meteorites falling on the moon when it was still in a viscous state or by the process of volcanism but it could be also by electrical discharges it could be also by bubbling activity and actually since I wrote this over 300 unburst bubbles so called domes were detected on moon. And it was found that the moon is hot. Even not all of its lights come from the sun. Over a hundred places were delineated that are glowingly warm, hot, and emit light and gases are coming out of several of craters. And experiments with electrical discharge were made and repeated this kind, some of the forms of the circular formations. And Mars had participated in those events. It was found moon-like. There is no place there for any intelligent beings as was thought one this so-called canali were seen first in the second part of the last century. And so it was found in that planet. And Venus must be hot if the history of the solar system is not a history of no change for billions of years. And Venus was found hot, not room temperature it was thought, until 1959. And in 1961 it was detected with radio means that it is something like 600 Fahrenheit and 
Mary Natu was sent out to find out true or not true. It was found that even more, it is a full 800. And if it is true that Venus was a body that escaped, erupted from Jupiter, as the ancient Soin described, and Jupiter is almost 400 times as massive as Venus. Then it must be covered, I claimed, by a thick envelope of hydrocarbons, which is petroleum-like products, polymerized hydrocarbons. And so it is, 45 miles above the planet, 15 miles thick, is this envelope of hydrocarbons. Dust and gas. So the Earth and the Moon and Mars and Venus clearly were involved in some disturbances, and recently so. But if this is so, then I put before me also a question. How could the thing happen if the laws of celestial mechanics are true? I figured out at unusual coincidence of situations it could have happened. A body and a long ellipse being retarded, meeting some obstacle would change to a shorter ellipse and then to a circle which would have happened to Venus. And by the way, one of the leading cosmologists of our time, Littleton, came out in 1959, 1960 with the claim that Venus erupted from Jupiter or at least from another giant planet, but most probably from Jupiter, on the basis of his calculation, not trying to prove me right. However, he put the time much more into the past. But then if there were events of this character, these charges between planets and so on, I put one of the most outrageous claims before the scientific readers that in the solar system and the universe generally, not just gravitation and inertia are the two forces of action, but that also electricity and magnetism are participating in the mechanism. So the Lord was not just a watchmaker. The universe is not free of those forces with which the man makes his life easy already more than 100 years. They were unknown practically or little known in the time of Newton in the second half of the 17th century. But today we know that electricity and magnetism, these are not just small phenomena that we can repeat as a kind of a little trick in a lab. That they permeate every field from neurology into botany and chemistry. And astronomy should not be free. But astronomers kept to that point. High tension as if there is written such a sign in the sky. Don't touch, don't touch the subject. And it was admitted by authorities that this was the most outrageous point in my claims. But the vengeance came early and swiftly. In 1960, already in 1955, radio noises from Jupiter were detected. And this was one of the crucial tests that I offered 
for the truth of my theory. In 1958, the magnetosphere was discovered around the Earth. Another claim. In 1960, interplanetary magnetic field was discovered. And solar plasma. So-called solar wind. Moving rapidly along the magnetic lines. And then was discovered that the magnetic field of the Earth reaches the Moon. So, by today, it is the situation reversed. If I would come today in an astronomical assembly and remind those assembled there that only 10 years ago and less, they were from the first to the last completely opposed to any introduction of electrical or magnetic forces as interrelations between the bodies in the universe or even more so in the solar system. Today the memory is so short that the people would start trying to remember, was it really so? But my opponents put it on record. I had a debate with the Royal Astronomer of England on pages of an English magazine uh, in Harper's with the, one of the astronomers of Princeton University and so many articles were written against my first book that this is today on record. Now, in the few remaining minutes, I would like only to touch the subject with which I started. Actually, I told you already that the ancient religion, for some reason, and now you can guess what reason was, were started as astral religions. But I started as a, as a psychologist, psychiatrist, and here before me a phenomenon. The things were seen. They were described not just in one verse of the Old Testament. Often by, by chance, any prophet pierced through the Psalms and see how many times. Actually, I was surprised to get recently from one of my readers an index to biblical quotations. There were over 230 of them in my first book, referring to those great upheavals, which certainly could not have been local, must have been global must have been observed by every survivor. Then if these things were described so many times, not only in Old Testament, but in every ancient book, ancient sacred book, whether it is Vedas or Mexican inscription, you go to Guatemala, you go to Mexico, you see all the temples, all the figures are Quetzalcoatl, which is planet Venus, Oisley Posley, which is Mars, it's now. The description, the story about the bitumen stuff falling from the sky, about all the mountains changing places, rising new, erupting. So many times it said Mexican sources alone. Actually, they speak nothing else but about it. And then you read it, you st stop at the motel, you find the Bible, you read it, and you don't see the most impressive things. That is the issue, the theme of the book. Then, for a psychiatrist, this is a phenomenon of scotoma.
And this is an important issue. Because if the man is a mankind actually, is suffering of scotoma and also of collective amnesia, and you can follow through the ancient literature and see how this amnesia overwhelms. How still somebody like Lucretius remembers and his contemporary and friend Cicero denies already. How the books of the New Testament and Revelation and Sibylline books and before them the books of Stoia repeatedly speak about phenomena which are today classified as vision of the last day. When the Stoia spoke about the catastrophe when the world was all aflame. And so actually the evidence comes from all places. And psychologists wonder when the evidence is from astronomy and from ancient sources with the astronomical minutes of the Babylonians or legends or sacred texts or philosophical systems whether from geology, from ocean, from the planetary system then you wonder what this forgetfulness signifies for us. We are in a state of a victim of amnesia. A humankind is a victim of amnesia. And a victim of amnesia does not act responsibly. He acts irrationally. His technological pro progress outstripped his understanding of his milieu and of events in which his ancestors lived or succumbed. And it is a dangerous situation when a victim of amnesia plays with thermonuclear war weapons. He enters into conflicts for which there is no reason. And in many of our actions, even as single individuals, we are sharing in that course of amnesia, of of not wishing to know, of preferring to forget. Of opposing to a book that said nothing more than was said already and told so many times in thousands of ancient sources. The very violence to, in opposition to that revelation is rooted exactly in this desire not to know. And this I feel my obligation. I'm going to campuses, speaking to the young, to tell them What you are taught is not complete. I put before you today a hundred questions. I could not put more questions in the short period of time at my disposal. But one question is above all. The humankind is safe, reasonably safe, from a new destruction from above. The system came to peace 
as in the Hebrew prayer, the Lord who made peace in the heaven, should keep us in peace. But the danger is in the man himself, as one of my correspondents wrote to me. Is not this thermonuclear weapon itself a symbol for that destructive celestial body that exploded in the face of the earth and the man likes to play and repeat that performance as a child not knowing what he is doing. By now, my time is over. And you ask me questions, I will try to answer at the best of my ability. And thank you.